Greg, what's up, man? So great to see you. It's been a couple of years, but man, I'm honored to have you on the podcast. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Great to see you too, Ryan. I'm really curious over, I think it mirrors it here. So I think over your right shoulder, you've got like some sort of like a attachment or rack or something right above your right shoulder. Oh, there's what? usually a guitar on there. A guitar. Okay. I'm like, what is that? Yeah. So okay. I hang my guitars from, from the wall. Uh, but after a, a, a three-year hiatus, our band is now back together. So most of my guitars are in our rehearsal space right now. Okay. The band is back together. I love to hear it, man. What kind of music yes. do you guys play? So as a bunch of 50-year-old guys, you know, if you will, um, the main the main objective for us is not to play music that makes us feel older. You know, so we try to stay, stay pretty current, pretty alternative rock. Uh, we're doing a bunch of Foo Fighters stuff right now, Kings of Leon. Uh, the killers, you know, that's kind of old. Stuff. You're talking about Foo Fighters, man. I mean, they, they're no, they're no spring chickens though. Let's they're not, but, um, but we try to shy away and I love petty and stuff like that too. But, but the standard covers, you know, of, of walking into a barn here and those, we try to stay a, a little bit away from that stuff. Fair enough, man. Fair enough. Now I've been looking forward to this conversation. You and I were talking about it. You just turned 50. I just turned 42. Somebody asked me the other day, just a couple of days ago, they like, they're like, I don't know if you know about what's going on in my own personal life, but they said, are you having a midlife crisis? I'm like, I'm 42 years old. I'm not having a midlife crisis. And she, and she said to me, she said, well, how long do you think you're going to live? And I'm like, um, shit, I am having a midlife crisis. What in the <laughs> world's going on right now? So I think a lot of guys are dealing with, uh, dealing with a lot of things in their forties and fifties. And that's why I wanted to have you on the conversation or on the podcast for this conversation. No, look, I appreciate it very much. And I think it's, it's, it's very real. I think, look, we're all, we're all going through a lot and our experiences are, are deeply personal. The situations and circumstances that we find ourselves in while there may be commonality and similarity in areas and, and, and we can go down any of those areas and paths, you know, that you want. Uh, what it also really comes down to it is they're ours, you know, and we've got to own them and we've got to, got to figure out and determine and learn how we want to handle and navigate and continue to move forward, you know, through, through them all. It's like that old saying, it's like, you know, if we all got together and we threw our problems out on the table, you know, we'd, we'd want our own back, you know, because in a way, like we know, we kind of know how to handle or feel a little bit even more comfortable with our traumas and our experiences and our own problems. Uh, but it's both. It, it takes community and support, but also an individual commitment to where are we going to go and how are we going to own it and handle it? You said an interesting word. You said trauma. And I've heard a lot of people talk about this and I scoffed at the idea a year ago, like trauma, you know, unless, you know, unless you've been through something tragic, you know, I was in the military. I've seen, I've seen guys who have gone through experiences where they've you know lost their brothers, like literally right in front of them, be blown to pieces in front of them. And these, these things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm, I'm like, I, I mock it, you know, it's like trauma. You, what do you know about trauma? So I, I'm always skeptical of the word trauma. And especially because what I see is so many of us love to hang on to that stuff because of the victimization points that come with mm. it. You know, it's like, I see guys, like, oh, well, this happened and that happened and this is what's going on. And it's like, are you trying to solve it or are you just explain? complaining about it because you think you're going to score some points with me or somebody else, maybe even a woman, for example. Mm. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, and now that you, you mentioned, you know, the word came up yesterday with my therapist, you know, my, my weekly therapy session, and it came up for my therapist and here it is coming out of my mouth. I don't think I use it all that often. I think it rhymes with drama, which is more along the lines of a lot of what I've what I've experienced and 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 what I tend to deal with on the family, you know, side of things in my history. Um, but it is interesting. I've never served in the military. Uh, so I would never profess to understand or comment on that level of of trauma. I don't know how it relates or use of words or, or vocabulary in terms of other things. Look, was I in the room when my father passed away? And was I holding his hand and watching him die? Yes. You know, that happened when I was 17. Was it traumatic? Yes. You know, have I seen my brother, you know, behind bars, you know, and through a, the plex, the plastic or plexiglass, you know, window visiting him in a maximum security prison? Yeah. Is that 
traumatic. I mean, whatever word you want to use to describe you know, these things, again, I think we have situations and circumstances in our lives that that can either defeat us or define us. And, and to what degree something falls on the drama, trauma, real order. Um, you know, I just try not to make any assumptions and I try not to make any many judgments and I'll share experiences and and also try not to give advice, you know, let people take from from these experiences what what can hopefully make them better, you know, and can help them. I think that's a good point. I, I'm glad you're talking about the semantics of it because <clears throat> I mean, that's important. You know, I, I, I see sides, for example, of the political spectrum that I mean, they just love to bastardize language and make a word mean whatever can solidify their current, you know, reality or narrative. So I think it is important that we talk about it. And, and I'm glad that you're also talking about not in a way, what you're saying, if, if I understand you correctly, is not comparing your issues to somebody else. Like, so for example, a, a, a somebody that's seen somebody die on the battlefield versus somebody who's holding their father's hand as he passes away. Like, why do we need to compare that? You know, I, I guess the, the concern that I have when we hear this word trauma and, and I'm just being really frank, I don't know if guys are going to agree with me or not. Just my perspective is like, it just, sometimes it just comes across as so, as, as so weak, you know? And, and I guess the question is, how do you, how do you, embrace the hardships, if you want to call it trauma or hardships or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it in your life or the struggles in your life without succumbing to them or wrapping yourself up in the identity of them. You know, for example, you said you're holding your father's hand as he passed away. Many people would use that to become their identity, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like, man, that's not really who you are. It's an experience that you had, but so many people wrap themselves up in it and can't seem to move past some of these traumatic or difficult, challenging circumstances they find themselves in. Well, yeah, it affects everybody very differently. I think it affected my brothers very differently. My mother, it's affected me very, very differently. And I think to your point, you have to take ownership of it and your definition of strength and move forward. And, you know, I chose to control what I could control, which also felt to me, what can I do to live my life to the best of my ability to honor his memory, carry the same last name, be the best version of myself I can possibly be and out there and hopefully live and lead by example. Or you could wallow in it, use it, default to it, make excuses or, or, or justify actions and behaviors may not be representative of the man you want to be because of something that happened to you. Like it's, it's, and I did a little bit of that for sure. We all do in my twenties, you know, in thirties, but, but, you know, here I am now at 50 I think of, and trying to run a, a long race and figure out at what rhythm and cadence, you know, I'm going to be able to, to sustain this and live this possibly, but do the very best job I possibly can you know, as my own, as my own man too. And now I have my own family. I mean, that's all we can do, right? Do, do the best that you can. The question is, how do you, how do you identify it? Like, how, how do you know? Like, are you, are you concocting stories? Are you infusing more meaning into situations? Are you making it more difficult than it actually needs to be? Um, are you playing the victim card? Like, how do you actually determine like for a man who's listening to this individually, I'm doing what I need to be doing in the face of this struggle or I'm not doing what I need to be doing and I'm using mm -hmm. this to victimize myself and actually hinder my own growth and progress. Sure. Well, I think you've talked about this a lot too. I think it, it, a lot of it comes down to what do you stand for? What are your values? What is important to you? You know, in a, in a framework that I put together that I've utilized myself, Rule number one is knowing what's important is what's most important. And that's taken me a long time to figure out what that actually is. You know, I spent years chasing salary and title as the metric of success and realized that that didn't bring me joy or happiness and certainly wasn't the most important thing overall. 
and spent time redefining what that really looked like. I'm putting my family first, my fitness and my health in there. Finance in terms of doesn't have to be everything and keep chasing this, but what does that look like for me in terms of success? Can I do what I want, when I want, with who I want, where I want for as long as I want? What does that look like? What do I put on my body with food and nutrition? What do I put, you know, what, what I do for fun, you know, what I've called my six F's, you know, even how I dress and what I want to look like, you know, there. And that became a more holistic metric of success. And that's tended to work a lot better for me you know, than a more singular one dimensional approach. So you're, I mean, you're shredded, like you're jacked. I remember that meeting you and then I see it on Instagram. Was that the one dimension is like, Hey, I'm going to be physically fit. And you know, this is, this is the identity or was it something else? And I'd love to hear about the six F's that you have. Yeah. It's, it's such a great, it's such a great question. Um, I think the, the aesthetics are a byproduct of healthy living. Mm. Now, did I train for aesthetics when I was a teenager? Yes. You know, I was bullied in high school, picked up weights, wanted to get jacked and big and keep the bullies away and maybe learn to take care of myself a little bit. Uh, but then, you know, and, and in your 20s, your metabolism in life is very different and everything, you know, respond well. You know, oh, 30s yeah. and so, we've got two boys, mine are 19 and 16 in there. Again, you're over-indexing. I fell into that trap at work, professional, you know, and chasing that. So you're not in the greatest of, of shape overall. And I really started to get it back, Ryan, in my in my 30s. I got really into CrossFit back then. And when I realized there was a master's category at 40 and I could be the youngest guy you know, in there, I was kind of all in. But what I've realized in a lot of these, these things that I've taken, I have a very addictive personality. You know? Had a significant drinking issue for, for a long time. Whatever I've kind of thrown myself into has gone towards the over-indexing I track. get that, bro. Mm -hmm. I get that. Yeah. So whether it was work and professional, and I'm going to be this big entrepreneur and I'm going to create a company and we're going to grow it. And then I end up selling it to a big prominent guy, or now I'm going to get myself back in shape. So I'm going to do CrossFit, but I've got to do the regionals and the open and get there. You know, you swing that pendulum into the, what I call again, the over-indexing trap. And I've eased off of that. You know, so now at 50, you know, really the aesthetics are a byproduct of healthy living where I have a, a, a solid training schedule. I spend a lot more time and money, quite frankly, on recovery and sustainability and longevity right now. I don't drink anymore. I don't say that, that I'll never drink again or that I don't drink. It's just really worked its way out of my lifestyle in the manner that I much prefer mornings to evenings. Um, I'm not entertaining clients, <laughs> you know, in, at night. There's this expectation in a way has gone away and I've I've removed it, you know, there. So I just genuinely feel better eating cleaner, kind of in an 80-20, you know, rule. I'll still polish off the rest of the pizza if the boys leave it over in, in there. Um, you know, and I just want to have fun with the things that that I do. Um, so I call myself more of a generalist than a specialist in that area which is, hey, bring me out to do almost anything and I'll get through it. I mean, am I going to win anything right now? No, but 30 years, give or take, you know, of, of, of training, I look pretty good for 50. You, know? you, <laughs> like, you um, look great, man. You look solid. Thank you. You know, um, and that's the goal. You know, the, my fitness goal is to be about 175 pounds, body fat percentage around 10%. You know, look good with my shirt off, feel good and not be injured. You know, that those are pretty much my fitness goals. What my deadlift is anymore doesn't really matter, you know, to me. Yeah, that makes sense. What are, so let's break down the six F's because I imagine fitness is probably one of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that makes sense. I think that's in a lot of ways, that's a low hanging fruit. That's, that's one. I think a lot of men will tend to focus on because it's super easy. And I know guys are like, it's hard. It's, it's not hard. You just don't want to do it. It is, it is easy. You just have to eat clean. Like you said, 80, 20 rule, and you have to lift weights. Like it, we all know this, but yeah. what are, what, what is the, the, the breadth of the six F's? Yeah. The breadth of the six F's is, is family, fitness, finance, food, fashion, and fun. And they're always in that order. Mm -hmm. And, and what I mean by that is for me, family always comes first. You know, that's, that's 
within my own house, that's my wife, my two boys, my immediate family is, is my number one priority. The fitness, as we were talking about, really is health overall. Mm -hmm. So look, you can lift weights, you can paddleboard, you can run, you can say so there's a million different things. And I love various modalities of fitness. So what I really mean is overall health and wellness. You know, the finance side, as I, as I mentioned, that's also different for all of us as men. You know, for me, I define, you know, wealthy. And now again, do I have enough money to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, with who I want to do it with for as long as I want to do it with? That's, that to me is the metric of success. I've foregone money at the expense of more time, you know, time with my family, time to myself to do things. And I have a pretty good understanding of what our needs are at this point to make sure that that's taken care of, again, under the framework that we've all defined and designed within our own home. Mm -hmm. Food is really nutrition, just like you said. You know, what do I put in my body? 80-20 rule. It includes things like I get my blood work done every 90 days. I have met with dietitians and nutritionists to figure out what it is that I should eat. My body responds well to and what it doesn't. So I'm pretty simple when it comes to things like supplementations. And I'm out there saying, you know, the nature of supplements is if is to supplement something you're deficient in. If you're not deficient in, you don't need it. So again, all these things kind of fall in line with where we spend our time, our money, you know, put in our body. The fashion one comes up a lot. And, and what I really mean by that is, is style, you know, and confidence as a man. What do you feel comfortable in? How do you want to be perceived? How do you perceive yourself? You know, I wore suits for a long time. I didn't like them, but it was part of the job. I was a partner in a large firm for a long time. And then I changed over my client list because I didn't want to really be a suit guy working with guys in suits. Yeah. And then I was the only one of the partners that didn't wear suits every day. And my clients didn't wear them either. And it was, and it was a challenge, you know, in there. But what I really mean in the fashion side is personal style, personal brand. What do you, what do you represent? You know, what do you want? Not about being on the cover of GQ, you know, or any of that shit. It's more about, hey, how do you really want to feel? And and I feel confident in a jean in, in jeans and a t-shirt. So that's pretty much what I wear 90% of the time. But I feel it's more all... confident in the gym wearing all black, you know, roan. So that's what I wear. The, the, the fashion or style, I choose the word style, but we're it's yeah. synonymous. We're talking about the same thing, but it's always interesting. I've got, I've got a good friend, Tanner Guzzi, who talks a lot about this. This is his, his universe. He talks about, yeah, this he's come on my show. Years. I love him. I've yeah, heard him. He's a great yeah. guy. He's terrific. Yeah. And it's always interesting because, uh, guys like buck that so bad. Oh, I don't care. I don't care. But him and I were talking this weekend because we actually happened to do a race together this weekend. And you don't hear guys talking about that when it comes to their other uh, physical representations of who they are. Like if they had the brand new, you know, three quarter ton Chevy, they're, they're not going to say, oh, I don't care about vehicles. Obviously they care or their beautiful home in the right neighborhood with the right acreage. Obviously they talk about it because they're so proud of it. But then you start talking about clothes and they're like, I don't, I don't care. That's stupid. That's nothing to worry. I, that doesn't bother me. It's like, come on now. Like clearly you're aware of it. Or if you're not, maybe you ought to be aware of it because the way that we present ourselves really says something about who we are and garners or hinders influence and credibility with other people. Absolutely. And look, I don't care, again, if you're super into it or not into it, Do be you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have guys that I work with, they just have a uniform. You know what? This is not something, again, I really want to spend a whole lot of time on. I really don't want to think about it. Certainly don't want to over-index in it. And they've developed a uniform. This is their look. It, it, it reduces and almost removes choice hmm, from it. And I've got buddies that go on stage, great speakers out there. They wear the same thing all the time. It's one less thing to think about. This is the brand. This is kind right. of who I am. I've locked in on something. Great. Other guys want to they really care a lot. You know, they want to shower again. Whatever, whatever you're into, and Tanner does an awesome job. And I steal from him all the time, and I quote him all the time. And I've tucked in shirts a few times because of and other and other stuff like that. Are you so, wearing Are you wearing the high waisted pants yet? Because I know he's an advocate. I am not, but he is an advocate. So I'm a little little skeptical not. of that one. <laughs> I think he's a, I think he's considerably taller than I am. I'm about five nine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he's six, six, one, maybe somewhere right in there. Okay. I do emphasize little things in there. 
to try to make me look taller rather than than shorter. So right. to that effect, again, I do care. Anything that elongates my look, you know, and can make me look a little taller is something I tend to gravitate towards. So that's really the main thing that I pay attention to in terms of kind of how I want to present myself. I'd like to stand up straight. I'd like to be a little bit taller. I'm not going to do anything look wise that kind of cuts my body in half or makes it, <laughs> makes it shorter. Right. Right. Okay. So I think we've and then the got, last one was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've got family. Let's see. I, I don't think I got it right. I've got family. I think I wrote it down wrong. Family, food, finances, fashion, but what did I, did I miss? We had in family, there? fitness, finance, fitness. Yep. Fashion and fun. Uh, and fitness, you know, and fun and was it? fun. Yeah. And fun Ryan was one that I, da- that I really kind of struggled with for a while and it felt juvenile you know, feedback a little bit was that it felt juvenile. What, a, you know, we're, we're men and what about, you know, fun, but I do think it's super important. And I think there are a lot of guys out there, particularly middle-aged guys that are not having enough fun, or if they are having fun, it's not the right kind, you know, or it may not be the best kind for them. And what do you again, mean by like, are you talking about like morality or are you like, what do you mean? They're not having the right kind of fun. What do you mean by that? Meaning that maybe they've gotten into this pattern again of, you know, going out after work with the guys for drinks right, and that's turned into multiple, whatever, sure. yeah, multiple or, Hey, they're golfers and, and nine, nine holes a weekend has turned into 18 is turned into 27 is turned into, you know, having a few more at the turn and this, that, and everything staying out a little bit later, not feeling as good in the morning. And I think all these things are connect. You know, it seems like, that's maybe what we're more supposed to do as men as we go, or we'll go out with couples and you stretch these, you know, you know, fun can be a lot of things out there. And, and I'm not judging anybody again, from a morality standpoint either, but I was having a lot of fun for a lot of years and it wasn't doing anything good for the rest of my life. And it started to not feel like as much fun after a while. Wasn't waking up feeling very good. I wasn't as productive it was reflecting you know on how i felt and how i performed and i've had i have different kinds of fun right now look man we vacation differently you know my the hours of the day are spent differently for me now than they used to be so that's an option too guys like in terms of what fun looks like to you there's a, there's a lot of things available out there and i think sometimes we just kind of limit or pigeonhole ourselves into the relationships, things that we've been doing, friends we've got, the habits and behaviors, which may not be the truest definition of of what we want to do for fun now or what we might be looking for. Yeah. Yeah. I think the problem is when fun becomes the end in and of itself. Like I'm just here to have a good time. I mean, that should be an element. And that's why I like this framework. You should have fun. But if that becomes the sole objective, I think that's a dangerous path to walk. That's not one I walk. You know, I know a lot of guys do. I, I if anything, I'm the uh, antithesis of fun. <laughs> like, I'm the I'm the disciplinarian. I'm I'm focused. I'm driven. I'm determined. Fun and happiness isn't something I strive for. And I've really found that over the past three six months, somewhere in there, this is an element. Like, it's a dimension that I have not tapped into as effectively as I could. And since I have started working on it. Life's a little different. It's a little better. It's a little richer, a little fuller. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm look. I'm I'm certainly glad to hear it. I think it's it's one of the goals out there. Look, I I want to be happy. I want to live a long, healthy, and happy life. So, what does that look like? Now, is everything I do fun? Not even close. Am I described as being boring? boring again and disciplined. You know, I talk about preparation, consistency, accountability. I talk all the time about show me your calendar. I'll show you your priorities. You know, what we schedule gets done. All of these, these things. What I've learned is when I was having a lot of fun and I was freewheeling around and I didn't have this kind of consistency, accountability, discipline. hmm? I also didn't have a lot of time and I wasn't really having good fun overall. And my life didn't look as good as it does right now. Now, everyone's, again, definition of fun is different. So, you know, I've been told, oh, you should live a little, you know, or do this or do that. I think I'm living just fine. 
<laughs> right. For me and for my family. Now, I think working out is fun. I enjoy it. You said it earlier. Like, that's not hard for me. Now, yes, it's hard to move heavy weight. Yes, it's hard to get punched in the face. You know, <laughs> yes, it's a debacle. You know, yes, it's hard to go and try to hold your breath underwater for several minutes at a time. And these things are hard. But in terms of getting me to go up and do them, go out and do it, that's not hard. I gravitate that towards that. I like sure. that kind of hard. Hard to get me to stay on past 11 right now. <laughs> like that's, you know, <laughs> or whatever. There are certain other things that are a lot of fun that I just pass on because when I compare them, do I stay at late? Do we go out with these other people? You know, am I watching them drink? Are they laughing? We're having fun. I get home late, don't sleep as well. And guess what? I'm going to miss the, the morning pool workout that I really look forward to. And that's fun for me with those people. Better one or better two? I just ask myself that question. Check, please. We're not staying that way. I'm going home because this sounds like more fun to me tomorrow morning and where I want to be and more around who I want to be with. Yeah, makes sense. So, all right, I'm going back to my list, but I think I only have five because I'm, I'm, I, it's, it's on my <laughs> end. I'm confused. I've got family. Yeah. Yep. Fitness. Yep. Finances. Yep. Fashion. Fun. That's five, right? You missed, you missed food. Food. Oh, food is different than yes. fitness. Okay. Got it. All right. Got it. Tracking. All right. I got it right here. So one question I had is, you know, you hear these things from people who are maybe older, uh, who will say, you know, uh, once you hit 40, once you hit 50, like just stop. I don't want to hear the rest of that sentence, but I'm not, I'm open to the idea that something happens around 40, 45, 50 years old to men. And I really want to hear your perspective because the midlife crisis, I think, is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And there's something happening, whether it's subconsciously or physiologically, there's something going on that changes and forces us to confront our current lifestyle and how we want to move forward for the next 40 years. Would you agree or disagree? I agree. I think it's very much a real thing. I think it affects men at different ages and stages of their lives. You talked about this at the beginning, 42, and it's, oh, you're having a midlife crisis. And, well, look, midlife is defined for, for men like 37 based on a life expectancy of around 76. Mm -hmm. Now, I also, I know some really old 30-somethings, and I also know some really young 60-somethings. So I do think it's a frame of mind and perspective and a, and a mindset in terms of how you approach it, but I think it's very real. You know, I had my, my tipping point was really at 47. 47 was the age my father was when he passed away. So that one hit me hard. Okay. And I think what you talk about or what you think about then is are my best days in front of me or are they behind me? Is this the best I'm ever going to look, the best I'm ever going to feel, the best I'm ever going to do? It's that, it's that time for a guy when he takes that long, hard look in the mirror and he may be questioning a lot of what's staring back at him. In all the areas that we, that we talked about, is this the career I want or is it just a job? Is it, do I quit my job and follow my passion because that's what I hear a lot of people ranting and raving about. That may be the most galactically irresponsible thing you could do, especially right. in middle age. Agreed. With obligations and responsibility. You think you're unhappy at your job right now? Guess what? Think about how unhappy you're going to be mm -hmm, without a paycheck coming in and still having all the obligations and responsibilities you As have. You say, without a paycheck and your wife, you know, being concerned with the bills and your kids not being able to join the football team because you don't have two nickels to run, rub together. Yeah, that's way more stressful then you're nine to five, I promise. And that's you. a whole other area. Most of the guys I work with, they've checked the box of finance. Like seriously, they've, those guys that I work Again, with, like, they've checked it. But unless that's you an are, easy thing, man. Like yeah. as we get older, the, the fitness and the finances, like that's easy because it's just numbers. Like it really is. It's just Correct. numbers. You got to go to the gym. You benched, you know, 225 pounds yesterday. Try to do 230 today. You look at your bank account. You're, you've got, you know, 200 grand in the bank account. I want to have 202,000 today. Like those are just numbers. Those ones are easy. It seems like so many guys get that dialed myself included. 
mm -hmm. tend to struggle with the other areas. Ab absolutely. And, and the reason being, I think as we age, energy becomes a big factor. I mean, conformity, complacency, redundancy. We start seeing aging maybe as something to fear rather than something aspirational. Start Guys start feeling what I call mediocre. Hmm? It just kind of is what it is, but it's not what I thought it was going to be. And I'm not what I really thought I'm going to be. And now it's been a while. Kids are getting a little older. Hmm? Been married, you know, a longer time. I don't have maybe the same drive in even those other areas that you talked about. My recovery time, even but even if I've got the stuff dialed in, my recovery time between my workouts is taking a little bit longer. Maybe I'm no longer in my prime earning years. I get a little crankier, a little moodier over the market dropping or the interest rates. I start to pay a little bit more attention to to politics and BS or this Grump, stuff or that. Grumpy that old are, man syndrome right here. Yeah, we're talking and, then, about. and you're just kind of like, is this it? Is this kind of what, and, and, and we also, we, we hear it, you know, in a way that kind of mediocrity and music loves some company. So are these more of the conversations that we're allowing in? And all of a sudden, just like anything that become that's consistency too. We're just consistently having the wrong kinds of conversations. We're just consistently hearing and absorbing maybe the wrong kinds of, of materials. We're consistently making poor choices in our habits and our behaviors. So we're starting to believe that our best days are not in front of us. So we're not taking that kind of action. We're no longer still embracing curiosity, having positive, exciting experiences, fun, the good kind, maybe adapting our, our workouts, our modalities, the way we, all of those things and remaining still being a student of the game. You know, and stretching it out. Like, I don't know how much, if I can, how much fucking runway do I have in front of me? Like, that's what I'm looking at. Hmm? Like, how far can I extend this runway? How much fun can I have? The highest quality of life. What does that really, really look like? Do I run a six minute mile pace? A nine minute mile pace? What feels right? You know, and all those things are in the bucket. You know, I think, look, at 50, I'm just getting warmed up. Like, I think I'm in bonus time. You know, my perspective, just because of my situation, is my dad wasn't here for any of this. You didn't get to see that. I'm in bonus time. So this is the time to really pour rocket fuel on it and make the most of it. And all the experiences that I've had, good, bad, and indifferent, all of those mistakes, take everything that you've learned and experienced over time. Now I get to apply it. And the reason I get to apply it and I think use my powers and experiences for good is because here I am at 50, in good shape, better than I've been, cleaner than I've been, more financially stable than I've ever been. And that, like, what can I do now? Because I was from the outside looking in successful for a long period of time, but a complete and utter fucking mess not happy, not fulfilled, certainly far more mediocre. I felt mediocre than feeling maximized in the way that I live. What you're saying right now, I know that there's thousands of guys who are listening who are like bobbing their heads up and down. They're in their car right now, going into work. They're in a commute. They're stuck in traffic to a job they hate. Uh, they're at home and they know their relationship is on the rocks or deteriorating. Uh, they're not connected with their kids. They know they've got 20 extra pounds around their midsection they need to get rid of. Like everything you're saying, I know how many guys are going to resonate with what you're saying. So the check, question check, becomes- Check, check, I'm writing check marks. Right. You know, we, we deal with it. We see, like, I'm not immune to it. I deal with those things too. I could stand to use, to lose a few pounds. And obviously my, my relationship is, is, has deteriorated at this point. So I, I'm there. Like I'm not pointing fingers or casting stones. I'm there. But the question then becomes- what do you do about it? Like, is it, yep. I, I, I kind of get tired of the like, well, you just got to get up and do it. I mean, yeah, true. I mean, ultimately, yes. But like, what in the world do the guys who are struggling do immediately? Right yeah. now. Now you're getting into the how, which, which I love. 
And when I say check, 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 as you're going down that list, that's me. Every one of those things and every one of those guys out there that's nodding their head, yes, I am that guy also. Been there, done that, lived it. There's nothing special about me. I'm just a guy <laughs> like thinking, trying to figure it out. And, and, and really, over time, that thought I had to do it all alone, thought I had all the answers, thought I was the guy to push the boulder uphill all by himself, not ask for help, not get any. I mean, that's how I lived for a long period of time. So when you talk about what do we do, and there's 53 million middle-aged men out there in the United States alone, and the vast majority of them are feeling this way. The numbers- What is what is middle, middle age? Is that, what do you say, 37 to what, 50? It's like is 30, that middle age? Call it like mid-30s to 55-ish, you know, in, or it, okay. in there. Got it, check, um, yeah. In, in that range, and that's 53 million, if you will, that are that are hanging out here in, in this space. And then the statistics are alarming on what men respond to, to the, all of those boxes that you were saying, check, 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 how they feel. But you're right, it gets down to how. I get the why. There's a lot of talk on why. There's a lot of motivation and inspiration. I get why you want to be in better shape, why you might want to quit your job, why you may want to, you know, why you want to be a better father or a better husband, or maybe you don't want to be a good husband, a husband at all anymore. It's run its course, whatever. I get all the why. I don't know, man. I don't, I don't think, I think, I think, yeah, everybody has the why they wouldn't be listening to this podcast. And as far as being a husband, like, I think most of the guys, if they're in that role, they want to be the best wherever they are. I, listen, I completely agree on that, but I, there's a long list of whys, whatever they are, we could keep going sure. where, where they struggle Easy. and where I struggled was on the how. And I think maybe a lot like you, I did not have the answers. And, and what I learned is if you don't have the answers, you better start asking the right people, the right questions. Hmm. I mean, that's really how even my podcast came to exist. I said, okay, here's what I've been chasing and it ain't working, salary and title. And I can tell you, you know, chasing authenticity where authenticity does not exist is exhausting. And I spent a long time doing that. Here's what I think it looks like. Family, fitness, finance, food, fashion, fun, so on. But I don't know a whole lot about those things either, right? Got some experience there. So let me bring on a tanner and I'm going to work on my side. Let me bring in a financial expert. Let me bring in a health and wellness expert. Let me start doing the blocking and tackling. Get your physical, get your blood work done. Stop listening to Bob on the corner who's 30 pounds overweight and doesn't work out, telling you what supplements you should take because Steve told him and so on and so forth. Right. This comes right. down to making a plan. You've got to have a plan. And what I call it is my map. I call it a maximized action plan. And it starts with knowing what's important is what's most important. Okay. What does that look like for me? And write it down when I work with guys. And let's define it and quantify it. Now, if you don't know where you're going, you're never going to get there. What are the goals? You know, we talked about quitting your job or follow your passion or doing this. We got to really talk about what's realistic and over what period of time. For me, it was three years, 47 to 50 were the transformative years. And it wasn't so much about reinventing myself. It was really about releasing myself and creating a framework and a plan that I could live and feel like me. So where are we going? What does this look like? You may not be able to quit today, but you know what? In 36 months, if we do this, 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 and this, you might be able to move to something else. Or you may be able to change your mindset, change your entire life, not leave, but be able to now use the proceeds from your job, see it differently to enjoy life in all these other areas that you haven't even considered. In there. You know, I talk about another thing, aggregate, curate, and eliminate, which is what I go, you know, acing life. There's a ton of noise out there. Any opinion you want exists. So many things. Aggregate them all, curate it down to what works for you, and eliminate everything that doesn't. And I think like you, I've had over 200 plus conversations like this where I don't do the talking. The guest does the talking. I do the listening and the learning. And when I feel so, or aggregating and something lands with me, I take it. And I use it and it becomes part of my framework. The key is, you know, the boundaries and not letting everything in and pulling yourself in multiple directions at the same time and thinking you're going to get anywhere. 
Yeah. Well, I think a lot of guys struggle with that because they think if I do, you know, somebody's not satisfied with their life, for example, they might think, okay, well, I got to get my, my success in place. I got to get my finances, my fitness, my faith, my, all this stuff. Got to get all that dialed in. And the problem I think is a lot of these guys get burned up and burned out because they're not used to adapting or incorporating any of these things in their lives. And all of a sudden it goes from zero to hundred miles an hour. It's like, what if yeah. you went from zero to 10, uh, for the next three to four months. And then you nailed once it. we get our feet under us, then we go to 10 to 20 and et cetera, et cetera. In, go, in both directions. Look, you go zero to hundred. What's going to happen. You're going to blow the engine. Mm -hmm. You go hundred to zero. You're going to fry the brakes. You're exactly right. It's about doing one thing, little wins. What does consistency really look like? We can't do it all at once. We can't do it in a second. You know, we're not breaking the speed record. That's not what we're going for here. We're talking about really developing a lifestyle and an oper personal operating system for how it is you do things. And that takes time. It took a lot of time to get where we are today. You know, it's going to take time to get where you also want to go next. The question becomes, are we, to are we doing a one? What are we doing with our direction? Are we completely changing it? Are we shifting it a little bit? You know, all these things have to be defined and designed. What's going pretty well? What's not? And that's part of that personal operating system. We mentioned earlier, like, okay, great. Now that we've done, you know, knowing what's important and we know where we're going and we've aggregated, curated, and eliminated, great. Break out your calendar. Because if it's not in your calendar and you're not actually doing these things, Say your family's most important. Show me. Did you take your, like, where's the time with your kids? Where's the time with your wife? Where's the time that you're working? Where's your, your exercise? Whatever it is, it's got to be quantifiable. And where's the open space you build in for your fun or for other things you know, that are in there? I don't even think that should be open space. That's one thing I'm questioning is like, oh, open space, fill it in the, in the blanks. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm kind of under the impression anymore. Again, this is not my forte necessarily, but under the impression, like you actually have to schedule that shit, which sounds weird. It almost sounds counterintuitive. Like you're going to schedule fun. Yeah. I need to yes. schedule it because if I so don't, what I, I won't do it. And that's exactly what I mean by the, by the open space. Like it is by design. It's not, it's not by default. You know, one of the things I say is look, mediocrity happens by default. Maximization happens by design. There's nothing there. That's not by design. But that also allows you to give yourself the grace and the gratitude and the latitude of, I can use this open space now how I choose. Or I can, this is where my fun goes or what it looks like. I mean, and it can be micro and it can be macro. Macro level, I put some big event on my calendar every quarter, some type of challenge or event or experience that I want to go to. That's a big thing. I put one on a calendar per quarter because I want something to look forward to. I want something to budget for. I want something to be accountable to. You know, I want my wife and my boys on board with it. I want them to do the same thing. There are things we do separately, things we do together, so on and so forth. On the micro side, it may just be, I like going for barbecue on Fridays and lunch. I do that in my open space. I don't see clients on Friday. I have a different day by design. But my reward my is I go for barbecue on Fridays. I go to my favorite place. I see the guys. I go. And you know, so it can be micro or macro. And it should be both. You know, I think you stack the daily little wins, but then you also have the bigger experiences and things that you want to work towards and look forward to and check those boxes as well. So one thing that wasn't included in your, in your uh, framework there, your, your six S is faith. Yes. And I'm really curious about your perspective. That's one area that I'm personally trying to work, work on in my mm -hmm. own life. What is your thought regarding faith? Yeah. It's so I was born and raised Jewish on the North shore of Long Island in a very non-religious family, what they call. I can reform. tell you're from Long Island, man. I can yep. tell like. It's so, I've got friends, a couple of friends, and I'm like, man, you remind me so much of those guys. It's, it's hilarious. You never really get off of like, I, I, I've been living in Texas for 21 years in Houston. Is right that now. right? I okay, yeah. born and raised here. Uh, but you never totally lose the Long Island. And now yeah. it just comes with a bunch of y'alls. And when I get back to New York, it's much worse when, I, when I I'm bet. back there. I bet. So, you know, I was raised very, you know, what they considered the words that are around now, 
look, I was privileged. I was entitled. I was raised in a reformed Jewish community and a reformed Jewish family. There was really nowhere to go but down mm. there and is the way I, I kind of viewed it. And that's hard. That was a lot of pressure. Mm. Definitely. And again, after my father passed away, after my brother went to prison, uh, I was not particularly gravitating towards religion or I didn't have a lot of faith. I didn't want to go to funerals. I didn't really want to go to temple. I didn't want to go to any, really didn't want to do any of that. And I've also, I ultimately married a Catholic woman, kind of a girl, girl at the time, woman, young woman at the time. We were sure. she, go 25 years at this point, you know, or so a Catholic school woman from Houston, Texas. And if you would have told me that I'd be married with kids living in Houston, Texas, in that situation, I would have told you to bet the under, it's never going to happen <laughs> from where I get. And, and here we are. And, you know, we have raised our children, our boys, uh, under the Jewish faith. I never asked my wife to convert. Neither one of us are particularly religious people, but we did feel like they needed an identity, a singular identity. However, really what I think it is, our perspective in my, is more how do we conduct ourselves how do we live and lead by example morally ethically we're more spiritual than we are religious and that's worked for us but as our boys have gotten older this is interesting now because now like and even i felt this i do feel more of a calling and more like we've missed kind of the mark in a few areas uh, about not knowing enough, not going maybe mm. deeper into some of these, some of these areas. And I feel like I do want to learn more and that there's more there. And maybe that's 50 talking. Maybe that's two years away from being empty nesters. Maybe that's thinking that again, we didn't bar mitzvah our boys, which is what you do. To, sure. We chose not to. Because where I came from and grew up, the bar mitzvahs were, were gaudy, big parties that were all for the wrong reasons and the right. And I didn't really want that. And I don't like to be that kind of center of attention. I didn't want that for, for my boys. I thought it was frankly a stupid waste of money and a lot of things, you know what I mean? And we thought about doing something privately and we ended up not doing. So it's a long-winded answer to your question but I think it's super important to have faith. I think it's super important to have something to cling to, to, to look towards. And I know that we we're gravitating more towards spirituality and we're thinking more about the next phase of our life and what that looks like. So I, I, I see that very much as a work in progress for us as, as a family, because I do question traditions and whether or not, like, I don't know if our, our boys are, are I, I don't know, I don't know if what traditions they're necessarily going to have. Like, have we been good enough of creating yeah. our own to us? I know if they, if that makes sense. You you got me on this one because I'm thinking a lot about it. I didn't get you. I'm just curious. Like, I, yeah, I, I'm just saying, like, no... you're really making me think in terms of it's something I've been thinking a lot about. And I just, I'm not great at articulating it yet because I just don't know if I've really kind of found the sweet spot. I think we're still looking. One thing, and I am too, I'm, I'm in a very similar boat, you know, obviously different background, not Jewish or anything, but like a different background, but very similar stories, uh, parallel stories maybe. And, and I've thought about that. One thing you said is, you know, cling to, uh, you know, and you hear that and that almost has a negative connotation. I don't mm -hmm. think you were saying it negatively, but yeah. you, you hear that from people and they're like, oh yeah, cling to your Bibles, right? You hear things like that. And I don't think it's so much of a, a, a cling to or an aspirational, maybe a little bit aspirational, but not so much cling to as much as it is, as, as it is a framework. You know, how, how do I behave? Like, what, what, is it, what, what are the eternal principles in which I show up that will inevitably yield the best results for myself and the people I care about? And so I people, think that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. That's the value, right? Isn't that the value is like, here are eternal principles that have been proven and time tested over and over again. They're universally applicable. And if you follow these things, that's going to lead you to the good life. Uh, I have a hard time understanding why people buck that so much. 
It's very I interesting. I think that to me. notion is is accurate, and I think whatever that is for an individual or a family, then that's great. Work do what works best again for you. Where I think it gets sometimes confusing. You know, in the middle, I talk about the middle is messy. You know, but the middle is also the the sweet spot in life. You know, and in and in everywhere in everywhere else, I think acceptance is also a big part of this. Which is, I think, fundamentally, a lot of we've lost the ability to, you know, agree to disagree. Like, look, you follow your faith and what works for you. You know, everybody can. There are differences there. I'm not here to 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 debate them. But if it works for you, wonderful. Do I support? You know, the ability to agree to disagree, or maybe that that might not be for me to see it that way or to live it exactly that way. But I think that that's okay. Also, you know, there. I don't know. I, think- I, I actually see the, the opposite from, from where I sit. I see too much agreement. I see too much acceptance or tolerance towards some of these things. Like there's certain things I don't tolerate that. Like mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't embrace that. I don't accept it. That's not part of the way that I view the world. And I don't need to be accommodating to some of those things. I get that too. And and I think that we're both saying the same thing with differently, meaning I don't have to accept and don't want to. And I might, you know, stand up for the point or whatever. I, mean, I can tolerate it, but yes. I don't have to accept it. Correct. Correct. Yeah, that's that's and there's that's a lot it. of stuff I don't want to tolerate and I don't enjoy, you know. Well, there's a lot of things we shouldn't the- and collectively as society, we don't actually, you know, we don't we don't tolerate, for example, people running around the streets killing each other just because they don't like the person. Like that's something we don't tolerate. So clearly there's a line in society of what we will and won't tolerate. And I think that line is acceptable. We just need to figure out where it is. Yes. And that line keeps moving in in different areas and we could talk about things that we accept, things that we tolerate, things that we don't, and go down a long list of, of, of things in there. Some we may agree on, some we may not agree on, so on and so forth. Everybody does. But I think, again, that we get to, we get to make that choice. Again, and how we want to live and lead by example, what we would tolerate in our own homes, what we would tolerate in our own behaviors, what we tolerate in terms of our own faith, all of these you know, in all of these areas and what we wouldn't. And at the same time, can we, you know, you know control what we can control? You know, I'm, I'm also, a, I'm, I'm big into, Hey, can I live and lead by example? Like the old advertising campaign, act locally, think globally, you know, exactly. Like what can I do day in and day out to try to live and lead by example? And hopefully by stringing enough of those days together, they will make a positive impression on other people, both in and outside of, of my home. Can I do that? Does that make a positive impact? Does what I choose to tolerate or not, what I choose to stand up for, say or not say, go or not go, do or not do, how does that radiate and permeate out? Because again, that's who, you know, that's who I really am. You know, that's what's really important to me is being authentic and being real and not always right. But how do I own the mistakes and the missteps that I make? How do I try to course correct and acknowledge when I do? Am I being intolerant or stubborn for the right or wrong reason? You know, like, hey, we got to we got to pay attention to this. You know, my finger's not always on the right pulse of things. Come on, you're, you're not always them. right. Are you serious? Huh, look, I you know what I say often. Uh, what is it? Often wrong, never in doubt. You know, something like that. You know, or yeah, in, yeah. in there. I like I also, that. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely, me too. But I also look. I reserve the right to change my mind. At this point, if you can show me a better way, a different way, I can learn something, and that seems great. I'm happy to change my mind. Why wouldn't I be? But if I feel very strongly about something, then I'm gonna I'm gonna hold to that too. What do you think? You you use the word authentic, um, and that uh, you know I'm challenging a lot of my own perspectives of life, and you know that's something I think people would generally agree with. You know, I'm trying to be authentic. It's like what 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 is what is that? You know, it's like are you are you trying to be congruent with a less ideal version of yourself, and then just 
blaming it on being authentic to who you are or, or is it disingenuous or not authentic to strive to be something you have never been before? Like mm. I, I'm wrestling with that word and that notion of authenticity because I just, there's, there's no like preconceived version of who we're supposed to be. It's only who we make ourselves into. Absolutely. I think I'll be wrestling with that word probably forever. And I think it may change. Also, you know, what I think of it as is that it's a feeling. It's something that I feel. There are times when I feel like myself and there have been times when I don't. There have been but times- But aren't you always I, yourself? Like, do you, you see yeah, what I'm it's saying? it's always like, me, but am I, look, but am I guilty of, of either playing a part or dressing a certain way for the position that I had or saying certain things that maybe I don't fully believe, but they're not, they're just, they're maybe not wrong, but they're not, you know, not right either. I was having a conversation at lunch today with, with a friend of mine about this when we were in, you know, previous incarnations of our lives and careers. I was like, I've been involved. We've been, I was in sales for a long period of time. I didn't always truly believe in what I was selling, nor were we delivering the excellence that we so-called claim right. <laughs> as a company, so on and so forth sure. in there. So did that feel inauthentic? Did I not like, again, the clothes that I was wearing, the way I was acting, the places I was going, the small talk or whatever that I was having? You know, the best that I can do with it is it's been a feeling to me where I feel like my my true self, if I can say that, and it feels effortless and it feels genuine and it feels like the actions, behaviors, statements all of it are filling my tank and, and bringing my energy level up versus draining it and bringing it down. I, I, I'm glad you make that distinction because when I hear that, sometimes I hear in the, in the popular way in which we use it, this authenticity is usually people seem to be using it as an excuse to be one of, I think, three things. Um, mediocre. Yes. An asshole or authoritarian, meaning this is my truth. Don't, you can't infringe upon my truth. That's how I see people using that term and throwing it around. I'm just being authentic. If you don't like the way I'm saying, I called you an asshole, but you know, I'm just, it's my truth. I'm just being authentic. It's like, no, you're just being a dick. Or you're just authentically an asshole. Okay. <laughs> fair, fair. And you know sure. what? If great, if that is the, the role you feel comfortable authentically playing, then terrific. I will classify you as an authentic asshole for the until you prove me wrong, but or you decide but you want to change. But it's not. It's not terrific. Like, like because that's not going to lead to a good life. Like you being quote unquote authentic is not always going to lead you to the best life that you could otherwise have. But let me offer this. Once I now know that, if that's when you are one not going to be in my life, authentically or inauthentically. Fair. Okay. Sure. Fair. And two, yeah. it is not my responsibility to be tr to try to change you or control you. I am responsible Good for points. controlling what I can control, living the way that I want to live, and I am choosing authentically not to engage with you. That's I'm a no point. longer going to get. I'm no longer going to participate in every fight I get invited to. Right, right. That like that could happen every day, and that is a tremendous drain and a tremendous time suck on my goals and where I want to go. That's not helping me turn my Fs into As. That's what I'm focused on. I am not going to give you my valuable time, the most valuable resource that I have to, to engage with your assaholic behavior and certainly not <laughs> repeatedly. Right. Or whatever it may be. Right. And while I can agree to disagree with you, doesn't mean I'm going to stick around for the latter part of this conversation either. So, well, there are plenty well said. of people I can agree with, plenty of people I can have more fun with, plenty of people I can make more money with, plenty of people to spend more time with. And even if that's only 1% of the 53 million middle-aged men out there, that's still way more than I need in my life to be extremely happy, healthy, and successful. That's where I want to be. It's powerful, man. I can appreciate that perspective. So as we wind this down, I, I want to ask, 
regarding the, this, this, uh, this idea of this midlife crisis, it, it's obviously that has a negative connotation. Crisis has a negative connotation to it. Mm-hmm. Um, you're 50 years old. I'm 42 years old. We're both right there. You seem to have an interesting perspective where most men, I think, tend to dread getting older and they think it's downhill from here, for example. How did you get that mindset shift or what would you say is that mindset shift so that people who are knocking on the door as we are might find their own shift and realize that their best days are indeed ahead of them, as you said earlier? Yeah. One, I think you're spot on. I think when you throw out the word midwife and you ask anybody, okay, I say midwife, you say what? Mm -hmm. Crisis, of course. Bingo. That's what comes up. So that's the mission. Can we flip the switch on that? Can we stop seeing midwife as a crisis and start seeing it as the beginning of the next and best phase of our life? That's I think really the mission we're all as men, we're on, we're on missions, you know, like what can we do, you know, here? So my mission is to dispel the crisis and help millions of men maximize middle age. I got tired of feeling mediocre. Didn't matter the age or the stage. I got tired of feeling mediocre that I was not having and living the kind of days that I wanted to have. And wherever you are in your life, it is never too early. It is never too late to start. But staying in that sweet spot of, of middle age, here's what I will say again. The middle is messy, but the middle is also the sweet spot. It's the middle. It's not the end. And right now, here's the other thing. The middle is getting bigger. The middle is getting bigger and longer. We have the ability to live happier, healthier, wealthier, stronger, longer than at any other time in our lives. We just have to start believing that. We just have to start living that way. And when you start taking those positive action steps each and every day, and they're they're tiny, man. They can be tiny. Swap one soda for water starting tomorrow. Go for your very first walk. Kiss your wife before you get out of bed rather than just take her for granted and roll out, you know, and actually have a conversation with your kids. Don't be the first one to your office and the last one to leave. If that's what you've been doing for 15, 20 years, like we let's try some different things. Let's be present. Ask yourself a very simple question when it comes to making choices. Do I go through the drive-thru today and, and get that, you know, McDonald's meal? Or do I eat something a little healthier today? Better one or better two? Do I take my dogs for a walk or do I sit on the couch and Netflix and chill? Better one or better two? You can do this over and over again. And when you start making better choices the majority of the time, I don't mean all the time, 50%, 60%, 70%, Percent. You start making the better choice the majority of the time, your life is going to get infinitely better. That's just math. Those are the outcomes that you take that determine your outcome. The outcome is inevitable if you take the right actions. Definitely. Just focus on today and then focus on tomorrow. And do one little thing. I do three, or wrap it up. I do three personal and three professional things each day. That is it. That's my rule. And they are written down. As long as I do those things, I've had a pretty good day. Now there is a laundry list. Sure, of course. Stuff on the to-do list. But I move over three personal and three professional things each day. And we do those. Perfect? Absolutely not. But the cool part is progress. And I think when we do this stuff, Ryan, what we have is we've got purpose, we've got process, and then ultimately we get payoff for what we do. And that's what I want guys to see. That, look, again, if I can do it, and you can, anyone can do it. it. It's not just possible, but it is highly probable that if you start operating this way, you are going to be happier. That's solid. In man. all areas. I, uh, as you're saying that I got thinking about this analogy, you know, I've been coaching my son's baseball teams and you were talking about the midlife being, being the sweet spot. I'm thinking about that on a baseball bat. 
Now, if you yeah. take a pitch and you hit that ball on the end of the bat, it's going to sting your hands and it's going to dribble to second base or shortstop and you're going to get thrown out. Same thing. You get jammed up and hit that on the, on the, uh, the handle of the bat, sting your hands. It's going to dribble in front of the catcher. He's going to throw you out, man. You hit that yep. thing in the sweet spot and you hit it right. Oh. That thing's going yeah. for a ride. Now, are you doing this too? Are you rolling the bats? You know, to make because here's the other thing. What are we trying to do? We're trying to make the sweet spot as big as we can, right? That's right. That's right. We yep. used to do. We used to roll. You know, you roll the bats and work them. You know, because over, you got to break them in a little bit. You know, you got got to expand man. that sweet spot. Yeah. yeah. And and that's also what this is about. Can we make the sweet spot as big as we possibly can? Because what happens when you do that? Again, less sting on the hands. You know. Smaller yep. surface area that's going to sting, bigger sweet spot at the end of the bat. Smaller, you know, what are you looking for? How broad can we make it? I like that. Well, Greg, tell the guys where to connect with you. You've got the Midlife Mail. Uh, is that that's what it's called, right? Midlife Mail. For some reason, I'm Correct. drawing a blank right now. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. You've got that book. Um, tell the guys where to connect, pick up a copy of the book, and learn more about what you are up to. Yeah. Thank you so much. Easiest place is midlifemail.com. And you can go there, you can subscribe to the podcast, the weekly newsletter, which comes out every Sunday, pick up a copy of the book. Um, I've also got a free PDF, the No BS Guide to, to Maximizing Middle Age. That's all free there. And um, Instagram and LinkedIn is where I'm most active, you know, on social, at Greg Scheinman, and, and just my name, not hard to find. We'll sync it all up. Um, now that I have been, it's been pointed out to me that I am, in fact, middle-aged, uh, you and I are going to be talking a whole lot more. Greg, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you very much. Hey, I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Ryan.